Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. Landfills that are um, taking over. In my household, personally, uh, we used to have three bags to five bags of trash per week. And now with all of our diverting our vegetative waste and all of our brown waste, we actually only have one bag of trash that goes out to the, the, the landfill. Overcropping, the cropping of the same um, plant in the soil depletes it of very valuable minerals, the concrete covered part, and what soil gets eroded. When you take all those factors into consideration, we actually have a very thin, small layer of soil that is available for growing. In consideration, if you are gardeners or just consumers, or you like to um, purchase, consider your food is a full part of the cycle. There's actually a part of recovery that can be done with composting. Like I do with the students in classes, we don't have fancy videos to be able to watch. So we're gonna go ahead and use our own um, selves, if you'll in get, indulge me here, take your hands and rub your hands together very, very, very fast. Now touch your face. What happened? All of that energy, all of that warmth, all of that that was created in one environment was transferred to another. The same thing that happens with vegetative waste and carbon, which we'll talk in more detail a little bit later, that you put it into the compost, you put it into a bin or a heap or a pile and all those organisms come to it and that environment gets very warm and full of nutrients and it decomposes and breaks down. Why compost? We already have discussed that there's not very much growable soil. We wanna keep the soil that we have and we want to restore its nutrients so we can have plants grow successfully in their best health. If you consider also the depletion of forests, composition, decomposition happens naturally in forests, in natural environments where the leaves fall, they dissolve into the ground, they give the trees nutrients. Also food deserts that so much of us are um, surrounded by individuals that don't have access to healthy food within a mile radius. The runoff of soil that occurs pulls those valuable nutrients, erosion of the misplaced materials. Materials end up in places where the plants aren't able to get that. And again, imagine that nature recycles. And when we rubbed our hands together, if you know that all of the energy, all of those good bugs, all of those um, organisms, mushrooms, compost, minerals, phosphorus, uh, calcium, nitrogen, all of those things going back into the soil creates a full, more diverse biodiversity in your soil. One of the first things that um, really initiated my interest in composting was imagining all these organisms. And Josh Futter with a and in our, um, uh, um, Pauling, not Pauling County, I'm sorry, we're gonna include a link that will be available for you to see about his eight minute mark when you see Josh talking about it, he very just um, does a very good job of describing all of those organisms that exist within that. So look for that link that will come to you in a, in a document with all the links for, from tonight. When you're composting, they need some valuable things just as other life, air, water, energy. Air, as you see in this picture here, was made available by pipes that were drilled with holes and they have a large heap. They drilled holes in the pipes to allow air through them. Aeration gives oxygen that the microbes and the organisms need in the compost. And this can also be met by when you add your particles, add mixtures of particles. And when you turn your compost, whether it's with a pitchfork or a tumbler, you're adding that air, you're mixing things up to give the uh, the organisms an opportunity to, to move and to effectively decompose. You need water, moisture, adequate moisture is essential. What comes from um, your vegetative waste, your wet waste, your kitchen scraps, your, um, your, your things that were once vegetables and fruit and stems, they will add some water, 
we'll talk about some troubleshooting in a while and that might be another um, remedy. So to make sure that you do have adequate moisture and water in your compost. It needs sun. It needs that heat for those microbes also. So we know that they need air, they need water, they need heat. I made the mistake of putting a compost pile under a tree in the shade when I first tried to test this before I became knowledgeable as a master gardener. So now I've moved it into the sun, into an area. And also you don't want compost to exist where there's a lot of roots because all of that energy, all of that decomposition, all of that energy breaking down needs to happen in its environment of a bin or a heap versus competing with the, the nutrients and trying to decompose the root systems of the plants. So consider that when you're looking for a place to put your composting. There's a lot of science involved and don't worry about reading the slide. I just put it up here because I think it's important for folks to understand that there's science involved, but you don't have to sweat it. Again, there's thousands of students that I have worked with that have been able to learn and manage and do composting from grades third to grade through high school. So it is not that complicated. If you see here in this picture, these students are now graduating high school, I've worked with them for that long. There's paper in the bins that they're putting. So that's being our compost. And then there's lunch scraps that have gone out to the compost bin. And you can see that these girls are turning the compost and making sure it's aerated well. There's a simple saying that they um, know very well. If it was once green and growing, it can be composted. I'm gonna say that again. If it was once green and growing, it can be composted. So that would mean, did it come from a tree, a plant? What if we're looking at a salad, but it has cheese or croutons? Well, the cheese actually is not from a tree or a plant. It comes from an animal. So of course not using animal byproducts. So that simple phrase, did it come from a tree or a plant? Was it once green and growing? I use a good rule of thumb of two thirds brown to one third green. So in a pie chart, it's nice to look at it that way, but if you use two to three times more brown waste than one third green waste, and you don't have to keep that a perfect mixture, you might have more leaves this time for fall, just know that you need to turn and add more peels and such later. So that rule of thumb, twice as much brown to green. I, this is just at my house. Um, here's a picture of one of many compost bins that I have on my counter. Um, when we first started composting, we actually just had a flower pot outside and we would just open the door and throw it out there before I got a nice bin for my counter. But you see that there's peels, there's stems, um, there's coffee grounds in here. And then the brown carbon can be provided, like I've already said, leaves. But even if you're getting cardboard with um, for your, your drinks when you're doing carry out or clean um, newspaper or clean paper towels, the brown paper, um, all of that can be ripped up and you want to make smaller rips and you can kind of layer it, not perfect because you don't want it to condense. You can kind of layer that in your bin and then when you turn it again, it will add that um, that nutrient um, aromatic. You can see our students here going out to their compost. When composting, of course, there's again, that a lot of science tied to it. And I do encourage that you go look at Josh's video to really understand that. But if you follow these basic rules to not add seeds, don't add diseased plants, only add grass if your compost heap and bin is really, really hot and you know that it can burn up the seeds, that, therefore you don't have grass going into your garden um, in addition to the grass that's crawling in. If you have something like, um, like Bermuda that's already going there, certainly um, you would not add chemicals. So some of our students would think, well, what about this bread or what about this um, tortilla? Well, no, the chemical is actually in there. There's some oil, there's some sodiums and there, there's some chemicals there. So although the grain, the main ingredient of that is was once green and growing, it should not go into the compost and no animal byproducts. Now in large farms, if you were a, a homesteader and you had a large farm and you had machines to, to turn and plows to turn the compost, you could probably use things with animal byproducts, but for home composting, think of the food chain, what eats what. You only wanna invite the critters, organisms that would eat the vegetative waste and that are attracted to the vegetative waste. You don't want to attract other varmint into your environment. The biggest, um, 
I think mistake that a lot of people make when they compost is they add too much vegetative waste. They only put their scraps out there. Here's a quick chart for you of symptoms, problem, solution. So if you have a bad odor, the problem is that it's probably too wet or there's not enough air going there into the compost pile or heap or, or bin. You just turn the pile is your solution. If it's too wet because it's a bad odor as well, just add browns. I have had a situation where one of our compost bins in our schools was on a line where the kids were getting on the bus. They were appalled by it. I went in, I ripped up a bunch more brown um, leaves and I got some shredded paper from the office. I mixed that in and by day two, there was no problem. It already remedied it. If your center of your compost is dry, there's not enough water. So you can add water, moisture, but you can also add more vegetative waste. Moisten and turn it. If your pile is warm only in the middle, it's probably too small. Now, I live in a complex or a subdivision that has some pretty strict hum or HOA laws where I have architectural control committees coming by. So I started with just decorative flower pots, putting my scraps and my vegetative waste out in those flower pots. And then I would just turn one from the next, but my piles were too small. So I needed to enlarge the pile. So I was able to get some, some other equipment to move in and, and be able to heat that up. If your compost will not heat up, it's very likely that it's lacking green waste. Um, so you just wanna mix more in. There are different methods of composting as you've probably already heard me talk about, and I'm gonna talk about them in the order of more labor and um, not as fast. So the heap method, as you can see in this picture here, there's just a heap or a pile made in some part of somebody's property. It does take more physical work and more monitoring. You do need to turn that more often. And there's the next step up to that is these three chamber bins. These three chamber bins, they, they still have some of a heap, but it is more contained. It's not spilling out onto the sides. So that containment helps keep it together and helps that temperature and heat and the compost decomposition happen faster. It also keeps that moisture in, but it is also more physical because what you'll do is from this third, the most full bin, you'll take from the bottom and move it to the second. You'll take what's starting to decompose and then you'll move work that's what's in the second to eventually when it's complete and then move it to the third. I'm gonna try this video one more uh, video again. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. We'll just come right back for um, the master gardener tour that we do in the spring when it's not COVID. Um, we had students demonstrate what they knew and what David was doing was using a pitchfork and he was turning the compost in these flower pots and then Lenore was demonstrating some other things about remedies and what you do for troubleshooting. The more expensive but less labor um, and less capacity are these tumbling systems. Um, they cost anywhere from two to four hundred dollars based on how big. Um, it does take time to turn. There will be a link in the document that's sent out to you as well. So you can see some of our students turning some of those bins, but it is much faster to break down the compost. Um, when COVID happened, I went and gained a lot of our garden supplies and brought it to the home to monitor. And my husband was surprised. He saw every, I, it looked like it was just soil with the exception of a couple stickers that got left on. So that, and he was like, this is amazing. It really is. It breaks down. The organisms do their job. Now, composting, vegetative waste, diverting your waste from your house is a very valuable thing to do. And I'm gonna talk about a couple different other forms that you can help so, uh, soil quality and help nature. Grass cycling is uh, where you would mow your lawn and perhaps mow it in a couple directions and let the grass clippings fall down upon your lawn to allow that nitrogen to fall back into the soil. When you do the grass cycling, instead of just hauling it off, you're making sure that it's good on the lawn. You're not stressing out storm drains. As you can see the picture of the dead fish, when all of this nitrogen hits the waterways, which it does just from the drains on our streets, the algae blooms actually choke out and kill aquatic life. When you also take your grass clippings, you're taking some very, very valuable nutrients and pesticides either into our waterway or you're taking it off of your lawn. Mulching is another very good um, way to conserve your soil's health. It does save in landfill capacity. You're not sending it off. 
uh, or you're not sending your, um, your scraps or things off. It's saving time. When you have a nice thick layer, about two to three inches of mulch, you are not, the water's not evaporating. It's trapping the moisture and the nutrients and it saves you money when you're not watering as much, when you're not replenishing and buying bagged compost, it's holding those nutrients in the soil. The, when you first start mulching, it's recommended to put uh, four to six inches of newly claimed com or, uh, compost into newly claimed soil. I actually also add a layer of compost. For example, when our church moved into a new location or our construction houses that are under extreme construction, they are, um, it's compounded soil. So to help those organisms start to move, I put that layer of cardboard down, which is carbon, um, and then add the the layers of compost and that will eventually help because of the organisms that come to the soil. Some recommended um, other items that you can do for newspaper. I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but newsprint, you can put newspaper, but just not the shiny material because that has too many inks and chemicals. You can use bag materials, pine bark, cypress chips. You can use compost material, of course, to layer that into your garden as well. Materials to avoid. You would avoid nutshells you would have, because nutshells, fresh hardwood, wood chips, and sawdust, they all, when they're still decomposing and in that decomposition, they're inviting molds and inviting things. I don't know if you recall when I talked about not putting a compost under a tree or competing with roots of a garden, the same concept and the same thing happens when you have those, um, those fungi and the organisms growing in there, it's in interrupting the soil's ability to do its job to grow the plants. Grass clippings, um, especially the lawn that we have here in the south, there's a lot of seeds in the grass clippings and it's very heavy in nitrogen. So, and it's clumped together. So you would not want to add that as well. And rocks will hold a lot of heat um, as well as they will um, create too much compacted um, soil. A very popular uh, way to compost if you have children, grandchildren, if you're a safe side adult that works in programs is vermiculture. Vermiculture is where you have a bin that's specially designed by drilling an appropriate amount of holes. I've seen Tupperware bins with holes drilled in the top and along the sides and a couple on the bottom and then placed up on bricks and put on a tray. And there you can take the, the kitchen waste and you need to take organic matter, whether it's leaves broken up or even dryer lint with natural fibers can go there and shredded newspaper. And you layer that newspaper into the bin under the, um, under the, the vegetative waste, your kitchen scraps, and the worms go to town. And I've always noticed when I feed them coffee, I get more worms for some reason that really gets them active. Um, so it is a, a contained area that really works well. And it's one of the highest in nutrients because the, the worm castings, the worm droppings are just that rich nutrient vegetative already processed. Um, all those nutrients that were originally in the vegetables go into your, into your uh, soil again for, for regrowth. And it's a very good teaching mechanism. Kids love to play with worms and find them. Similarly, when we had a chart for troubleshooting with the health of compost, you have some similar troubleshooting with worms. If your worms are dying, you possibly either have too much food, it's too wet or too dry. So if it's too much food, you can increase your worms or decrease and divert some of the food that you're putting in there. You can add dry bedding or paper if it's too wet. If your bin is attracting ants, that means it's too dry and they're able to maneuver and, and make a place there. So you moisten the bedding, but the bedding works very well when it's shredded newspaper, moistened and put into, the, into your uh, vermiculture bin. If your bin is attracting flies, that's because the food is exposed. So if you cover that back up and even mix it into some of the soil amendment that you have, that will reduce the, the fruit fly issues and adding that more bedding, like I said. If there's a rotten odor in your little vermiculture, it's too wet or there's not enough oxygen. So you'd wanna drain, so potentially adding more holes in the bottom. Um, you wanna cover the food again um, if it smells, just as if it's attracting flies because they're finding it for some reason. Um, or you have too much food, so you would reduce the amount of food. So I, 
hope. I, I already feel like half the half the inspiration is already here because you've made it here tonight, um, or you'll be watching this later for those that'll do that. I, if I could just give you some kernels of understanding, just do something, even if it is only on Saturdays, you divert your vegetative scraps and you take your brown paper and you mix it in a pot out in your yard. Don't sweat the perfection. If you have a problem you need to remedy, you basically are adding either adding more carbon, adding more vegetative or turning it. It's pretty simple. And then um, just, uh, just don't let the whole elephant intimidate. I wouldn't recommend if you haven't composted before going out and spending the money on the bins, try to just take one part of that at a time and just start with one small pile, experiment and get comfortable. I'll tell you, um, after I saw this movie called Dirt, I was, I was changed. I, I couldn't not have a cause for soil prevention and caring for the soil when I saw it. So this was enough to make a burning bush for me to become the self-proclaimed compost queen. I hope it's something that is, um, is something that if you find time that, to watch it, that it'll inspire you as well. Resources, your extension organizations are very, very good resources to gather information. And hey, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching, and please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.